Hey, welcome everybody to today's lecture on grounded theory. All right, so we're going to get started here. I'm acting a little bit more uh, energetic than I usually am. I'm pretty laid back, but because we don't have the conversation element to this lecture, I'm going to pretend to be extremely excited for your entertainment purposes. Not that I'm not excited, I'm just usually uh, pretty low-key. All right, so grounded theory. Long story short, it is used to develop a new theory. When a grounded theory researcher begins, he or she doesn't begin with previously done research or research literature or anything like that, simply because we don't want that affecting our theory that we're about to create. My dog is saying hello to me right now. I wish he was a little bit taller so you could see him. Anywho, grounded theory developed in 19... Uh, we'll say 67-ish, late 60s, um, by two gentlemen by the name of Strauss and Glosser. These two guys were med students in, I believe, like the University of San Francisco or something like that, and I believe they were studying um, the process of, maybe not the process, but dying people in the hospital. And um, from the data that they were collecting, they realized something was emerging. And um, they didn't know what, they didn't know exactly what they were seeing because it wasn't part of their preconceived notion of what they were studying. So they came up with grounded theory. And long story short, it is a theory grounded in data. And I'll get into that process a little bit later. But... Uh, that's in the 1960s, a couple decades pass, and then in 1990, Strauss teams up with a gal named uh, Foreman, and they kind of revamp the idea of grounded theory, and they create what is now referred to as systematic design. And systematic design is recommended for new PhD students or first-time um, dissertation students or writers. They, they recommend that they use a systematic design because Strauss and Corbin developed a eh, system to help the researcher identify categories, themes, things like that, help them develop this theory. Well, in 1992, and this is where I find uh, it to get kind of interesting. Oh, that's bad. In 1992, Glosser, or Glasser, I don't know how to say his name, responds. And I think it's funny because I'm picturing this um, as kind of a Glasser thing, Strauss stabbed him in the back. So I'm going to pretend that this is a giant war between two giant egos it could just be an intellectual thing that is introduced, but I think Glass was pretty upset with Strauss, and he responds with, uh, no, if it's systematic, then you're defeating the entire purpose of grounded theory because it's supposed to, the theory is supposed to emerge. It's supposed to emerge from the research it's not supposed to be preconceived in any way. So in 1992, Glasser responds. And all of a sudden now, 
the grounded theory has two prevalent design approaches to how it should be done. In the academic community, it's important to note that quantitative researchers actually really respected the idea of grounded theory because of the rigor involved, which we'll get into later. Um, but the rigor that it takes, the amount of detail, the amount of time, the amount of data collection that it takes to create a theory, quantitative researchers really respect it. So in the academic community now, we've got two ideas of what grounded theory looks like. Well, in um, the year 2000, a student by uh, a gal, Charmaz, I believe it's a gal, um, comes about with, I always forget this, sorry, um, constructivist design. And it's somewhere in between the two, between Strauss and um, Glasser. But the main theory here is that it needs to focus on participant values, beliefs, things like that. Sharmaz also says that the researcher brings values, experiences, and priorities to the research process. And she qualifies that by saying any conclusions developed are suggestive, incomplete, and inconclusive. Important to notice, and this is part of the ethical issues involved with grounded theory, you can't ever remove the researcher bias from the theory, from the data, from the observations. So, currently, in the year 2016, there seems to be a few more designs, but these are the primary designs. There you go, those are the three primary designs of grounded theory. Boom. What are you gonna look for, Carl? And if it's ever gonna happen So as I'm standing at the station It might be over soon So in grounded theory, there are six commonalities, um, at least on a big picture perspective, and that's what I love to start with is that big picture. So we're going to start with the six general steps of conducting grounded theory research. Uh, we're going to start here, even though in Cresswell he mentions memos as the sixth step, I'm going to start with memos because it's not necessarily misleading, but it took me a while to understand it. I thought it was simply a way for a researcher to keep track of interviews, whether it be in um, documents, movies, no, anything like that. But what this is, um, it's a way for the researcher to document hunches, ideas, things like that. I have a notebook of ideas that I keep track of and um, just writing down like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, that's interesting. What about this? What about this? Kind of like reminders for the researcher as they go through the data analysis to see if it works, if there's a place for it, things like that. So amongst all grounded theory researchers, the idea of memos is extremely important in how to keep track and organize a lot of this data. So it's important to mention, and I, I, I mentioned it in the quick introduction video that was absolute nonsense, but hopefully a funny way to introduce this whole thing. Um, process approach. So the best way to, to describe this is, let's say I want to study how we, a cohort, balances our studies, our work, and our play, or our personal lives. And instead of studying the phenomenon of balance, a grounded theory researcher, oops, can't talk and write at the same time, um, studies the process of balancing. And uh, 
amongst any process is a series of interactions between the participants, between the researcher, between the process, all these things. And uh, it's very, very important that all grounded theory researchers are identifying a process. If you know Brene Brown, I'm going to keep mentioning her, she, she talks about leading a wholehearted life and the process that that takes in order to do that, uh, which I love. I love her work. Um, so, process approach, step number one or two, whatever. The next is theoretical sampling. A qualitative researcher has access to, uh, or I'm sorry, a grounded theory researcher has access to all qualitative means of gathering data. However, interviews seem to be the primary means to collect data. And I think that's because that is where we want our theory to come from. We want our theory to come from participants and we want it to emerge from them and the interactions that they have. So if I was, if I was um, studying us, I would study how, how we each interact with this process of balancing work, play, and studies. So interviews, but you can also do public records, you can also do a document analysis, all sorts of anything, surveys, things like that. Um, anything that a qualitative researcher can use, a uh, grounded theory researcher can use as well. Constant comparative data analysis, and this is why quantitative researchers respect grounded theory research because of the rigor and extent of this process. I like to view it as a uh, ping pong match between, um, between data and creating a theme. So if I had to draw a diagram, it would be something like this where here is our data. We've I've interviewed each of you and I have I have it all written out. I have my memos, I have things like that. And then I'm going to develop an initial theme or category. The words theme and category are used uh, more or less to, to mean the same thing. And so I take the data and I develop a theory. From there, I go, okay, here's my theory, or maybe I have a couple of theories. I'm going to go back and I'm going to interview you guys again. Perhaps I'm going to start collecting different types of data. Depending on what this theory reveals, I might start, I will certainly interview you guys again and ask clarifying questions or things like that, but maybe I'll, um, I have no idea what I would do next. It would, it would highly depend on what I find first, but maybe I start interviewing you guys on your background, your history of schooling, maybe your family history, things like that. From there, I develop another theory. And from the data, I collect another, I, I, I put together another theory or perhaps a couple of other categories and guess what? I go back, interview us again. Maybe this time I go outside of our cohort and start interviewing different people in different stages of this process. And I go back, develop another theory. I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until the data starts to settle, my theories start to settle, and all of a sudden, a few primary categories start to emerge. From there, let's say I have five categories that I think from all the data, there are five categories that seem to hold true for everything I've done so far. Eventually, Let's just say that one. Eventually, one will emerge as the universal or what I like to consider it as the umbrella category, the, the, the core category. And the core category, it has, we have some limitations and we have rules in terms of how to develop a core category. But essentially, every category and every uh, theme can be explained through this core category. They can all be connected through it and uh, 
so Brene Brown, if you will, um, you know, she had fear, shame, all these things, and then eventually she created this idea of a wholehearted living. I don't know what ours would be, but if I'm studying our cohort, um, perhaps this is a, uh, I don't know, having a sense of humor about the whole thing. That's been getting me through. At, at times when I take myself way too seriously, I get so bogged down, and I have to remember that I don't know what I'm doing, and uh, kind of seems like a lot of people don't know what they're doing, but we're all trying our best, and for me, that gives me a little perspective. Maybe that would become my core category. I have no idea. But that's what a core category does. And finally, we have a theory generation. So, from our core category and our other categories or our other themes, we now get to develop a theory. There's another process for that, but the point of grounded theory, and this is key, the point is if we're going to choose grounded theory research, our purpose is to create a new theory. So, and I think I mentioned this before, we're not going to pay attention to previous research, previous lit reviews, anything like that. We want to develop a theory before we go down, before our analysis is um, affected by anyone else's. So, in my theory on our cohort, I'm going to develop a theory that relates almost exclusively to us. Maybe it'll be uh, the process of uh, all doctoral students finding a balance, but it's going to be pretty uh, focused on that specific process. So it's not going to be applied to a lot of other parts of education or a lot of other, let's say, balancing anything else outside of the realm of, of doctoral work. Um, so that's pretty important that if you want to create, in my opinion, it, this is totally my ego talking, I want to develop a theory. So I am drawn to the grounded theory because I want to create something new. Um, if that is our goal, then grounded theory is the way to go. And that, my friends, is grounded theory. Thank you.